can you look at the person next to you and say, man, I like your mask? <laughs> you doing it? I love it. Can you look at the other person and just give them a big thumbs up? Hey, this is great. This is great. Well, thank you so much. It is really great to be here. Um, you know, I have a message that I believe that God put on my heart for us tonight, and I just pray that it speaks to us. You know, I, I really believe that we're living in a pivotal moment. Has anybody here ever felt like they've been in a pivotal moment in your life at one point? You know, maybe it was your high school or your college graduation, and you're standing there, you're receiving your diploma, and you can just sense the possibility that's before you. Or maybe, maybe for those of you who are married, it's when you were standing here at the altar, you were making your vows, and you could just sense that that moment was going to change the rest of your life. Or maybe, maybe it was the first time you asked that person out, and you were a little bit nervous. You were just wondering, you know, this, this could really be it. This could be a pivotal moment in history. I remember sitting right about there when I asked her out for the first time. Uh, she said yes, so that's awesome. Praise God. Can we give it up for Donna, my wife? She's amazing. <laughs> Pivotal moments, significant moments. You know, some of them can be great. Some of them uh, can be just amazing and incredible. They can be positive. But some of them can be negative as well. I, I look uh, across this room and I would say probably for the majority of us, we can still remember where we were on 9-11. You know, for those of us who are millennials, we can, we can say, I remember where I was on 9-11. Just those numbers have meaning to us because it was a pivotal moment. And so sometimes pivotal moments are positive. Sometimes pivotal moments are negative. And sometimes pivotal moments are not moments. Sometimes they are years. Sometimes they take time to walk through. But we must walk through them before we can discover how we will remember those moments, how history will remember those moments I think we're living in the midst of one of those moments today, in this season, in 2020. We're living through one of those moments. As we watch, as we live through the midst of a pandemic, as we watch, as we live through natural disasters, as we watch, as we live through cultural, cultural turmoil, we can sense that we're standing in the midst of a pivotal moment. And you know, the disciples of Jesus, they also lived through a pivotal moment. They had watched, they had heard, they had lived through the teaching of Jesus. They had been with him in his life, and they, to their astonishment, to their confusion, they lived through, they walked through his betrayal, his death, and everything that went with that. He was crucified right there in front of them, and they were so confused. Then they hid in fear, wondering what was going to go on, what is happening. But they were astonished once again to hear that Jesus had risen from the dead. Talk about a pivotal moment in history when Jesus rose from the dead. And so Jesus, after rising from the dead, he calls his disciples together for one more pivotal moment. Imagine the sense of gravity that would be there in that moment, as the disciples are standing around Jesus, you know, Jesus has called them all together. He's risen from the dead. They're there on the hillside. And he says, everybody come together. And they're standing there. They sense the gravity of the moment, waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. And that's the scene we find as we come to our text today. The disciples waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. If you want to turn with me to the book, the book of Acts, chapter 1. We're going to be reading from 6 to 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. It says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Similar to the disciples, I think that we, in 2020, are living in the midst of a pivotal historical moment. And today I want to unpack this passage with us. But before we do, I want to let you know where we're going. You see, God began putting this message on my heart in October. As I was looking at the world and I was watching what was going on, I was watching the unrest, the cultural turmoil, the political division, the stress, the fear, the anxiety of a worldwide pandemic and everything that was going on around the world and in our country. And today, as I stand before you, my hope is to accomplish three goals. Today, I stand before you as a teacher. I want to unpack this text with us, but I don't stand just as a teacher. You see, I I'm also standing up here to speak prophetically. And I don't mean speaking prophetically in the sense that I'm about to tell you some sort of revelation about the future. But when I say I'm here to speak prophetically, I mean, I believe that God has called me to speak into the culture from his word. That's what it means to speak prophetically, to speak his word into the culture. And I want to clarify here that this means we're going to step into the mess. We have to step into the mess. In order to speak into it, we have to step into it. We're going to step into the mess tonight. But that leads me to my third reason for standing before you tonight. The third reason that I believe God began putting this message in my heart at the end of October. Because I want to stand up here tonight and pastor. And by doing so, my prayer is that God's word will challenge those of you who are feeling comfortable. And that God will comfort those of you who are feeling challenged. So tonight, I stand here with these three goals in mind. And let me begin by speaking as a teacher and let you know where we're going. Let me give you the main point from the text today. The main point I want you to remember. Our pressing questions reveal our kingdom priorities. Let me say that again. Our pressing questions reveal our kingdom priorities. As disciples gathered together, they sensed the significance of the moment. They sensed that they were standing there and something was about to happen. And they asked Jesus a very logical question. Jesus, is this the moment? Is this the time? Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, we talk about restoring something. We think about maybe an old car. It used to have a former glory. It used to be something really nice. It used to be something really special. But time has taken its toll on the car. But people who are, are passionate about cars, they take it, they love it, and they restore it. They bring it back to its former glory, its former significance. And so the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the moment? It's a logical question. You know, just like an old car or a historical artifact, Israel once had a former glory. The disciples, the people of the day, they knew the history. They knew the times when the kings reigned, when King David was king over Israel, and they had unity, they had power, they had money, they had everything that they needed. It was a great time to be in the kingdom of Israel. They prospered when David was king. But since then, from that time, they had fallen further and further from that glory. Eventually, the kingdom was divided in two, and over time, they just fell further and further from following after God. And eventually, a foreign kingdom came in and took them out of their kingdom, took them into exile, into a land that was not their own. Their enemies came in and removed them. It's in this context that the prophet Jeremiah says, I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. And they eventually made it back to their own land. God did bring them back to the land of Israel. But it wasn't very long until another enemy kingdom came and took over. 
It wasn't long before they were ruled by the Romans. And so they were in their land, but the kingdom was still not theirs. So the, peop- the Jewish people of Jesus' day, they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a Savior who would come and finally restore things, put them back the way that they should be. And Jeremiah recorded God's promise when he said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. The disciples knew that Jesus was the person that Jeremiah had talked about. The disciples knew this. The problem was most people were looking for a political Messiah to come and restore the kingdom to Israel. You see, they didn't quite understand the death and resurrection of Jesus at this point. They saw it. They knew who Jesus was, but they still didn't completely understand it. So what did they do? They asked the wrong question. The disciples asked the wrong question, and and we tend to ask the wrong questions, don't we? We can do this from time to time. We get so focused on other things that we get sidetracked and miss what God really wants to do in our lives. And this is where I want to step into the current cultural climate. We need to step into the mess for a moment if we're going to be able to step out of it and bring hope, speak hope into the mess. I think we can all agree that it's pretty messy right now. Anybody? Yeah. But this is exactly why we as Christians, we need to step into the mess. We need to step into it, and I believe that's where God might want to speak to some of us tonight. Somebody say, step in. All right, let's step into the mess for just a moment. But remember what I said at the beginning. We want to speak prophetically into the culture. We want to step into the mess, but then we want to pastor that moment so we can bring hope to the mess. So we don't just stay in the mess. We can step out of the mess. We're going to step into the mess, but then we're going to bring hope to the mess. Say hope. Hope. You know, there's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot going on in our country right now. We've been asking questions about the pandemic. We've been asking questions about racial justice. We've been asking questions about politics. And if we even have a moment to breathe, we start asking questions about natural disasters going on this side of the globe and the other side of the globe. And if that's not enough, we start asking questions about military conflicts in different parts of the world. If we have even a moment to step out of the mess in America and look up, we realize that the world is a mess, and we ask questions. It's a mess. Hear me, friends. We need to ask these questions. We have to be asking these questions. We have to ask questions about politics. We have to ask questions about racial justice. We have to ask questions about the pandemic. We have to ask the questions. But we as Christians need to speak into the issues. We need to speak into them. But look what's happening in our country. Look what has happened over the last several months. Our country is completely divided. And even worse than that, the church is completely divided. Guys, if you allow me for a moment, I want to speak prophetically to the church. I want to speak God's word into the culture of the church. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It doesn't matter if it's politics. It doesn't matter if it's racial justice. It doesn't matter if it's the coronavirus. Everyone has an opinion. And everyone who has a different opinion is wrong. Or even worse... Everyone who has a different opinion is following the will of the devil. And I'm not exaggerating. People are saying that. It's true. It's happening. That's how divided the church is right now. If you don't agree with me, then you must be blinded by the devil. You must be following the will of the devil. Guys, this is the church. We're not supposed to be this way. And I know this is heavy. Trust me, we're going somewhere. We're going to bring hope into this, but we have to step into the mess because the church is divided. 
Friends, this should not be. This should not be the way that it is. We as Christians need to speak into these situations, but the way we're doing it is not working. Can I ask you a question? Can I speak prophetically tonight? What was the content of the last thing that you posted on social media? What was the last conversation that you had with a friend or somebody else? Was it helpful or was it inflammatory? Was it civil or did it start an argument that got the whole conversation off track? If your initial response is, yes, but, yes, but this is the truth. Yes, but this is what they need to hear. Yes, but this is what I need to share. If this is our response, then we've completely lost the ability to listen. We're no longer asking the right questions. And in fact, if this is our response, we've stopped asking questions altogether. We as Christians have to be different. Yes, I, I say it over and over again. We have to speak into these issues. We as Christians, we need to be engaged in the culture. We need to speak into these issues. But there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. We need to be different as Christians. Please let me allow the Holy Spirit to be the one who speaks in this moment. How have you been responding to the current cultural climate? Has your response been helpful? Or have you just been adding more fire to the flame? You see, we have the tendency to ask the wrong questions. Can somebody say wrong questions? You see, it's a mess. It's a mess. This is heavy. This is heavy. When we speak prophetically into the culture, it gets heavy. It gets messy but we're going somewhere. So stick with me. We want to bring hope into this. We want to bring hope into this. We're Christians. We have the hope. Somebody say hope. See, the incredible thing about Jesus is that even when we ask the wrong questions, Jesus gives the right answer. Somebody say the right answer. That's the second point today. Jesus always gives the right answer. Number one, we tend to ask the wrong questions. And number two, Jesus gives the right answer. Notice Jesus' response to the disciples. He begins by saying, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Then Jesus reframes their perspective with what he says next. Catch how Jesus reframes their perspective. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Basically, what Jesus is saying is, this isn't your focus. The timing of things, leave that up to God. That's, that's up to him. This is not our focus. Let me reframe your focus. I have something different for you. This should be your focus. In this pivotal moment, the disciples were standing. They were asking the wrong question. The wrong question was, is this the time of the restoration of the kingdom? The right question would have been simply, Lord, what do you want us to do for the kingdom? As they're standing there in that moment, they say, Lord, what's next? What do you have for us to do? Let's talk about the kingdom for just a moment. The disciples were thinking about a political kingdom with a geographical place in Israel. But Jesus had something different in mind. Jesus was talking about a spiritual kingdom that included people from all nations and all generations. Look at what Jesus said about the kingdom. You know, the Pharisees came and they asked him a similar question at another time. They said, Jesus, when is the kingdom coming? And Jesus replied, the kingdom is not coming in ways that can be observed. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus taught that the kingdom is not of this world. That this kingdom has no end. Jesus reframed the disciples' perspective. 
We're not talking about a physical kingdom. We're talking about a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus is the king who would reign over all, not just the land of Israel, but people from every tribe, tongue, nation. That's the kind of kingdom that we're talking about. So here's what Jesus told the disciples to do. First, the disciples would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And there's a whole lot that could be said here, but that's another sermon. So let me just summarize it for you. Jesus simply said, he was emphasizing the fact that you need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to speak into the mess, if we're going to step into it and then hope to bring people out of it, We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you read through the rest of the book of Acts, you see the disciples receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and going and do amazing things on behalf of God. And the church grows in amazing ways because the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you need this to accomplish the goal that I have for you. Then Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Say witness. What's a witness? Well, in court, we talk about an eyewitness, somebody who saw what happened, whether it was some sort of crime that was committed, or you might have an expert witness who knows a lot about a particular topic, and they come in and they give an expert witness because they've seen it, they know it, they understand it. And sometimes I think we can kind of over-spiritualize this word witness. You know, we talk about, I'm going to be a witness for Jesus. But we forget that the word witness, witness means somebody who actually has experience and who has knowledge of what they're talking about. They have knowledge of the thing that they're sharing. And the disciples, they were witnesses to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. But we're witnesses too, maybe in a slightly different way. You know, we are witnesses to the hope and the joy and the peace and the power that Jesus can bring. We are witnesses of this. And so as we speak into the culture, we can witness to these things. We can bring these things with us. We can be a witness of these things. So Jesus said that they would be witnesses to various places. And again, we could spend a lot of time unpacking this, but again, I just want to summarize it for you. He begins by saying, you'll be witnesses in Judea, or in Jerusalem and in Judea. That's basically, that's their neighborhood. That's their town. That's where they live. You're going to be a witness to your people. Then you're going to be a witness in Samaria. That's kind of the next town over. The Samaritans, they had a a shared heritage, but they had significant theological differences to the point that they actually hated each other. Their differences were so strong that they just would not associate with each other. Jesus said, I'm calling you to be a witness to those people too. And then you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Basically, that includes everybody else. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your geographical location. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your political perspective. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter. You're going to be a witness to them. They were called to be witnesses. And catch this, they were called to be witnesses to the beginning of the restoration of the kingdom. Jesus was He was reframing their perspective. He's saying, no, I'm not here as a political Messiah to restore some sort of kingdom to the nation of Israel. He said, I'm here to restore a spiritual kingdom. I'm here to gather the people of God. And you're going to be witnesses about that, and you're going to be witnesses to it. You're going to witness the beginning of the restoration of the kingdom. And what's fascinating here is if you think about some of the characters that Jesus called to be his witnesses, and I've asked two gentlemen to come up and uh, help me, so if you could take your spots here at the front for the illustration. We want to think just a moment about these characters, these disciples that Jesus called. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about the fact that the disciples had personalities, that they were people with backgrounds and stories, Let's think about Matthew for a moment. We'll say Matthew's over here. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was a person that pretty much everybody hated because he represented the oppressive government. 
he was a Jewish person who basically said, you know what, I'm going to go work for the oppressor and become a tax collector. It's, uh, it's not a good thing. People didn't like him. The disciples probably were not fans of him. And uh, if you've ever seen the, the show, The Chosen, uh, I love the way they just portray this. But they had a really bad reputation. Mark chapter 2 says that as Jesus reclined at the table, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining there with him. How would you like to be lumped together in that phrase? You know, Jesus was there and he was hanging out with the nurses and the sinners. Or Jesus was there and he was hanging out with the, the bankers and the sinners. You know, today it might be something a little bit like Jesus was there and he was hanging out with the politicians and the sinners. That's the kind of perspective that the people had on tax collectors. It was so bad that there were actually Jewish laws that said if a tax collector walked into a house, the house immediately became unclean. It was so bad that there were some Jewish laws that said you shouldn't receive money from a tax collector because they probably acquired it in some illegal fashion. That's how much the Jewish people hated tax collectors. They were despised because they represented the oppressive rulers. So you have Matthew, the tax collector, and then over here, you have Simon, the zealot. Now, after the time of Jesus, there was actually a political party known as the zealots. And the zealots were passionate about their country. They were passionate about their religion. And we don't know if if Simon was actually a part of kind of this group before it gained official recognition. But by his very name, we know that he was a passionate person. He was passionate about his country. He was passionate about his faith. And oftentimes those two things went together. You know, some of the people even thought, should we be paying taxes to Rome? So you have a zealot over here who's like, should we be paying taxes? And then you have a tax collector over here that says, let me take the taxes for the oppressor. And Jesus calls both of them to be his disciples. So what happens when you have two people in the same room with different perspectives like that? Notice how they're both facing the wall. They're not even looking at each other. Their perspectives are so different that they can't even come together. Notice what happens when Jesus calls them together. As they turn away from their own perspectives and, and Jesus calls them to a purpose and they start coming together into the middle and they think about the purpose that God has for them. They begin to turn away from their own unique perspectives and then they start facing the same direction because Jesus has a mission for them. And so you have people who are totally divided, focused on their own thing, but Jesus calls them together and he gives them a mission and suddenly they're no longer at odds with each other but their mission unifies them. Thank you guys, you can sit down. Can we, can we thank them for their help? Does this sound just a little bit too familiar to anybody here tonight? They put their differences aside, they put their perspectives aside, and they focused on the mission that Jesus had given them, and that's just two of them. All of them had their perspectives. They all had their backgrounds. They all had their beliefs and their opinions. But when Jesus called them together, he said, hey, this is the mission. This is the top priority. And tonight we're talking about perspective and the questions that we're asking. The questions that we're asking, what do they say about our kingdom perspective? And, and I want to ask tonight, you know, have you ever had the opportunity to be in a relationship like that with somebody? When's the last time you were intentional to reach out to somebody who had a different opinion about something than you did? And just have a conversation to listen and learn from them. Because when we start listening, we're able to get a better perspective. We're able to get a better picture and that's what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to have that bigger picture, that answer. Because Jesus always gives the right answer. And he gives the right answer to the right question. Jesus, what should we be doing for the kingdom? Can you imagine if we stopped asking all the wrong questions? Can somebody say wrong question? 
and allow Jesus to give the right answer. Say right answer. As the worship team comes, I want to look at what happens to the disciples when they hear the right answer from Jesus. And again, I know we've been talking about some heavy stuff. We've been walking through the mess. It's hard to walk through it because it's deep and it's painful. And there's a lot of it going on right now. But I believe that God has given us this opportunity to speak prophetically into the culture. We're in a pivotal moment right now. And as Christians, we have a unique opportunity to step into the mess and bring hope into it. Because Jesus didn't just stop there and say, hey, you'll be my witnesses. I'm going to empower you along the way. He didn't just give us a hope for the moment. He gave us hope for eternity. And that's the third point today. Jesus' answer gives us a mission and hope for the future. When Jesus had commissioned the disciples as witnesses, he was lifted up in a cloud and taken out of their sight. He was lifted up to heaven with a sense of finality. There was something that said, this is a unique moment. Jesus has gone to heaven and he's not coming back right now. There's a sense of finality. But the amazing thing about that is Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's ruling his kingdom without the limitations of time, without the limitations of space. He's ruling his spiritual kingdom from his heavenly throne. He's not stuck in 33 AD in the Middle East, ruling a kingdom from there. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling a spiritual kingdom. That's why we have hope today. That's why we can step into the mess. And that's why we can pull people out of it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples, they simply stood there and watched Jesus go up into heaven. And then the angels come with another important question. Why are you still standing here? What are you standing here for? And then they, they kind of give us a, a hint to the reason they're asking that question. And they say, one day Jesus is going to return in the same way that he left. Why are you still standing here? Jesus is coming back. But he gave you something to do. And there's two things that we can see from the words of the angel that give us hope, that help us step out of the mess, that help us to step beyond it, that help us to walk through it, but then come out on the other side, unified as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ. First, the words of the angels, they reiterate the mission that Jesus had given them. They ask that question, why are you still standing here? As if to say, hey, you have a mission to accomplish. Why are you still standing here? Go get to work. Jesus is coming back, but you have something to do in the meantime. Why are you still standing here? And then the second key point from the angel's words is the hope that that gives the hope that the words of the angels give. Hey, Jesus is coming back in the same way that he left. They give them words of assurance. Jesus is coming back. One day he will return to earth. One day he will set up a kingdom. One day we will be in that kingdom and it'll be physical and it's going to be amazing. One day Jesus is going to return. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. That's hope right there. That's hope for the mess that we're in. That's hope for everything that we're facing right now. That's hope for everything that we're seeing going on around us. That's the hope for our nation. That's the hope for the world. That's the hope for Jerusalem and Judea. The hope for Samaria. The hope for the ends of the earth. That's the hope for the disciples in the first century. That's the hope for the disciples in the 21st century. That's the hope for us right now. This is our hope. This is what we rely on. When we have questions about the pandemic and we have questions, and hear me, again, we need to ask the questions. 
when we have questions about racial justice, when we have questions about politics, we need to ask the questions, but we need to ask the right questions. And we need to listen to what Jesus would say, the answer that Jesus would give. Because friends, we have a tendency to ask the wrong questions. But Jesus always gives the right answer. And the answer that Jesus gives, it gives us a mission. It gives us something to do, and it gives us hope for the future. The title of my message today is I Pledge Allegiance. And my question to each of us is where is our allegiance? Where are we pledging our allegiance? To what kingdom are we pledging our allegiance? Are we pledging our allegiance to an earthly kingdom? Or are we pledging our allegiance to the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom that gives us hope to deal with everything that's going on right now? We're, we're in a moment. We're in a pivotal moment in history to make a decision. And just like the disciples standing there with the words of the angels, they had a decision to make. What were they going to do in that moment? And I believe we have a decision to make, each and every one of us. What are we going to do? You know, the disciples, the book of Luke tells us, they ran with joy to Jerusalem. They waited for the Holy Spirit to come upon them and then did amazing things for the kingdom of God. And if you keep reading, you see those things. But I believe today we can do the same thing. We can listen to what Jesus is going to say to us. Remember, if you remember anything from what I've shared tonight from this passage, the key point tonight are pressing questions reveal our kingdom priorities. Our pressing questions reveal our kingdom priorities. Say kingdom priorities. You know, we can tend to ask the wrong questions, but Jesus gives the right answer. And his answer gives us hope. His answer gives us a mission. And tonight, I just want to take some time to pray because this is heavy stuff, but we need to grasp that hope. We need to step into it. And this is where I speak pastorally. We need to step into it, but then we need to bring hope into the midst of it. And we as disciples, as followers of Jesus, have the opportunity. Jesus gave us the answers and we can share these answers. And so tonight, I just want to ask a question as we go into a time of prayer. We'll sing another song, but I want to take some time to pray. And if you, like me, believe that we're in a critical moment, my question is simply, what are you going to do about it? Like the disciples, they made their decision. They ran to Jerusalem with joy and waited for what God had for them. We're in a pivotal moment in history. What are we going to do about it? What are the questions that we're asking? Are we asking the right questions? Are we asking helpful questions? What do the questions say about your kingdom priorities? Are you going to allow Jesus to answer your questions? Are you going to allow Jesus to send you on a mission to bring hope into the mess? Remember that our, our pressing questions reveal our kingdom priorities. As we pray tonight, and I'm just going to ask everyone for this moment to bow your heads and close your eyes just so we can listen personally to what the, the Lord would say to us. I believe even in this moment, as 2020 is a historical moment, I believe this moment right now could be a pivotal moment for somebody in this room. This very moment could be a pivotal moment, a pivotal moment of hope. And I've said it multiple times because it's so important. We don't want to leave here with the mess. We want to leave here with the hope. And maybe tonight, some of you are just weighed down by the mess that we're in. Some of you just need that hope. You're overwhelmed by everything that's going on. You're overwhelmed by everything that you're seeing and hearing. The moment you try to shut it off, it comes up somewhere else and you're just overwhelmed. Maybe for you, you need the hope of salvation. Maybe you just need to start with that relationship with Jesus tonight to surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I declare that you are my Lord. You are my King. I want to be a part of your kingdom. 
Or maybe for some of us, it really is just, we need that hope to remember that Jesus is coming once again, that there is an answer to everything that's going on. And one day Jesus will return and that's what will matter. Maybe we just need hope. And maybe there's some people tonight who need hope. Maybe there's some people here tonight who just feel like you know the mission that God's given you, but you haven't really been walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe tonight you just need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit so that you can walk in that power and accomplish the mission he's given to you. Maybe tonight you just need more of the Holy Spirit overflowing in your life. And maybe tonight, maybe tonight, God wants to speak to you. Jesus wants to speak to you about how you've been interacting with the current situation in our world. Maybe you've been asking the wrong questions and and Jesus wants to help reframe your perspective. Let's allow Jesus to work in our hearts, to reframe our perspective, to pour out his Holy Spirit and to give us hope in this moment. And I'm gonna pray for you in 60 seconds, but I just wanna take this moment and say, if any of that applies to you, if God is speaking to you, would you just stand where you are as an acknowledgement to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, I just wanna listen to what you're saying to me. I'm not asking you to stand for me. I'm asking you to stand for Jesus, to stand for yourself, just as an action step to say, God, I'm listening to what you are saying. If you feel like God's speaking to you, would you just stand where you're at right now as I pray for you? Father, God, we are standing in the middle of a mess. And God, it's hard to walk through. It's heavy to walk through. But God, we know that you have given us hope. So God, I pray for each and every person who's in this room tonight. Lord, would you give them that hope? Would you give them that peace? Would you give them the courage to keep going? Lord, would you have this way? As we sing one more song, Lord, would you do your work in Jesus' name? Amen.